You've been searching for the best way to generate passive income in your life and heard that real estate is a great way to do it. But you're tired of all the so-called gurus who are all talk and no substance. Get ready to celebrate because Kevin Buck has spent 14 years successfully making it happen. This is the Real Estate Investing for Cash Flow podcast. Now, here's Kevin Buck. Hey guys, Kevin Buck here, and I want to welcome you to another episode of the Real Estate Investing for Cash Flow podcast, where our mission is to help you build and maintain massive amounts of cash flow through income producing real estate investments. And our guest for this week's show is real estate and multifamily syndicator, Reed Goosens. Now, Reed is originally from Australia, and he moved to the U.S. in 2011 for the love of two things. Firstly, his wife, and then secondly, the Big Apple, New York City. And now within the first year of living in the U.S., he had purchased his very first duplex for $38,000. That experience taught him a lot about the benefits of investing for cash flow here in the U.S., where the barriers to entry are a lot lower compared to his homeland of Australia. Now, fast forward to today, Reed has gone on to start RSN Property Group, a multifamily syndication investment firm, which has been involved in the acquisition of over $60 million worth of real estate to date. Now, in addition to his real estate investing endeavors, Reed also launched the podcast, Investing in the U.S. in early 2016, and is the author of two top-selling real estate books. And here's what you're going to learn in our conversation with Reed today. You're going to learn how he transitioned from buying small duplexes to large apartment communities. You're going to learn how to create successful business ecosystems that will recession-proof your business and establish long-term wealth. You're going to learn how to successfully start syndicating larger multifamily deals. You're going to learn how to develop a strong personal brand. You're also going to learn how to cultivate a top-notch team and company culture. In addition to that, we're going to talk about how to develop and scale a business and then much, much more, guys. And so with that, I'm excited to get onto the show with Reed. But before we do, I have a few quick housekeeping items. Like I do each and every episode, I like to share my one personal best and one professional best from the prior week. Now, starting with the personal best, just want to say that I had an absolutely incredible Thanksgiving uh, with my family here in Florida. Um, following Thursday, uh, you know, Thanksgiving Day, my wife and I, we took the, the boys out to the beach and enjoyed a wonderful Florida winter day. In fact, uh, that day, Friday, which is uh, Black Friday, everyone else was out shopping and we spent time on the beach. I can't stand going in stores uh, most days, and especially on Black Friday. So we, uh, we hightailed it to the beach, took the boat out to one of the sandbars and let the boys play out there. And it was just an absolutely gorgeous day, not a cloud in the sky, uh, which are the exact type of days uh, and the reasons why we live in Florida. The winters here are absolutely amazing. Uh, one of the other cool things that happened during the Thanksgiving uh, long holiday weekend was one of my closest friends, Ray, he uh, tied the knot on Saturday and married the love of his life. So to chalk it up, it was an absolutely incredible week filled with many special moments uh, that ultimately created lots of amazing memories. So uh, just a wonderful holiday uh, extended weekend there. Uh, now, the one professional best, uh, I was recently asked uh, to assemble and present an alternative commercial investment panel at a very large multifamily event happening here in Dallas uh, this coming February. Now, uh, I'm going to bring together leading experts in self-storage, medical office retail, and then also my favorite, mobile home parks. There might also be another asset class that we throw in there, but uh, we're going to get together on this panel and discuss these alternative investments. Again, this is a multifamily conference, and so we're going to be kind of the redhead stepchilds of that room and be talking about other places to put your capital. After all, I like to say that there, there's a million and one different ways to make money in commercial real estate and this panel will show the merits of some of these alternative asset classes. And so I'm excited to be speaking on that panel and, and assembling just a, a group of rock stars there that specialize in these different asset classes. Uh, moving on here, guys. If you love what we're doing here at the Real Estate Investing for Cash Flow podcast, please take a moment, go over to iTunes, leave a rating and review on the show. And like I do every week, I like to give a shout out to uh, one of the recent uh, folks that have left a review. So today, this review is from Lee Forge. And Lee says, Kevin provides some of the most in-depth information on real estate investing out there. 
I've listened to almost every episode and it just keeps getting better. Well, Lee, thank you so much. Appreciate you taking the time to leave that review. It means a lot. Uh, in addition to it meaning a lot to me, it also means a lot to other folks that are number one, looking to become a guest on the show or number two, looking for different podcasts to add to their to their daily listening habits. Okay. They want to know that there's some good content here. And so you taking the time to leave that review means a lot, not just to me, but to many others out there that are looking for great real estate investment information. Moving on here, guys, just want to remind you of the free 30 minute phone call that I offer each and every Friday. This is where you can get on the phone with me for 30 minutes and talk about everything and anything your heart desires regarding real estate investing. Okay. No ulterior motives here. I won't try to pitch you a coaching program or sell you anything. Uh, this is just a way for me to connect and, and to give back and also to meet uh, each and every one of you, hopefully at some point in the future. So go to kevinbup.com to get signed up for that call. And uh, now guys, without further ado, I'd like to get onto the part of the show that you've been waiting for, which is our interview with Reed Goosen. So here we go. Alrighty, guys, it's my honor to introduce my guest for today's show, multifamily expert and fellow podcaster, Reed Goosens. Reed, how's it going, my friend? G'day, mate. Uh, thanks for the expert. I don't know about that, but we'll, <laughs> we'll try know, and change man. people's minds, minds about that. You're, you're making magic happen, so uh, you got to be somewhat good at it, right? Right? I love it. You say, trying, putting one foot in front of the other. <laughs> we had you on the show many years back, so I've been doing this podcast now for, gosh, it's going on six years, which is crazy how time flies, and, uh, and I was going to look back, and I just didn't, but I think it's been probably three or four years since we, since we last had you on the show, and uh, you've had a, a lot of big things that, that have changed in your life for the positive, right? You've made a lot of just leaps and bounds over those last three to four years, and so I'm very very excited to kind of dive in and, and find out what's been going on with Reed, man. Like what you've been up to. I know you've been out there buying larger multifamily projects. Uh, you've written a, co a, a couple of books. Uh, you're still doing your podcast. Uh, you're hosting masterminds. I mean, you just got, you got, I think you got more than 24 hours in any given day. So we're going to figure <laughs> out what the magic is there and how you fit in more than 24 hours in, in, in the day. But before we you know, go into, you know, what you've been up to the last couple of years, Reed. Just for those folks that maybe aren't familiar with you um, and your story, maybe take a few minutes and give us a little bit of your background and ultimately how you got into this business. Sure, sure. Well, uh, to kick it all off, yes, my, my deep Southern accent from, from, from Australia down under. Uh, I don't come from the United States. I, I moved to the US uh, back in 2012 and I moved to the US for, for two reasons, uh, both lo love related. Uh, one is the, the love for New York City. I wanted to live in New York City, be an expat there. And the second one was for the love of my then girlfriend, now wife, Erica. She, she's American. And, uh, and really, the, the story is that I, I, my background's in structural civil engineering. Um, I, I, I had a, you know, went to university, went, a, went abroad uh, after university back in the mid 2000s, 2007, 2008. Um, had a great time working overseas. Um, met Erica actually backpacking around Europe. Uh, moved back to Australia in early 2010. Um, really tried to figure out what I want to do with my life because I, I, I understood that I didn't want to be stuck in a cubicle for the next 40 years. And that's where I stumbled upon the book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And, and I picked up that book, um, was really, you know, my, 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 the blinkers came off, everything like that. I started to understand what entrepreneurship meant. Uh, dove into real estate investing as, as an investment vehicle just because I happened to surround myself being an engineer around develop, developers and I didn't know what a developer was. And Mm -hmm. Um, but still had a real passion to move and be, and live abroad. And, and I really essentially, you know, chase, chase my, my wife, Erica. Uh, so I, in, in early 2012, quit my job in Australia, a very well paying job and moved halfway across the world to the United States and, uh, didn't have a job lined up here. Uh, I, I, I pounded the pavement to, to get, to, to find a job. I finally got a job and, uh, that was sort of step number one. And step number two was to get, get to my first real estate investment networking event. And that's what I did. And I think within six months of, of moving to the United States, I bought my first triplex in, in upstate New York because the barriers to entry here are just so much lower compared to Aussie. And, uh, and you know, fast forward seven years now, I've been in the United States. I, I now control about $150 million worth of multifamily real estate. I have my own podcast, uh, written a few books. Um, yeah, just truly trying to build the ecosystem. I'm my own boss. I've become financially free, wealthy or you know, financially free and, and I've quit my W2 job. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I've got married and got my green card. So, you know, all of it's happened. That's like, awesome. And uh, that's just a little bit of a nutshell. So my, my big message to everyone who's listening, who, who is listening out there is that if I can move halfway across the world, didn't come here, I didn't go to school here, didn't have family here, didn't have a network here. I started from literally zero. I think I had 30 grand in my, 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 my bank account for, for saving and I was able to start with that and, and build it to, to you know, a quite a nice little nest egg and still continuing to build it. If I can do it, then, then so can the average person listening to this show. So, so yeah. 
Yeah, I think the one upper leg that you have is that cool accent, man. I always give uh, <laughs> our director of operations, uh, Jethro Van Art. Uh, he, he's from South Africa, from Cape Town. Uh, and, uh, you know, he's, I always joke with him, tell me he's from Australia, just because, you know, somewhat, somewhat similar. That's at least <laughs> similar accent. All, I always joke when I introduce the people. All Canadians are the same, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's funny. Well, um, it's I tell him, I tell him, like, man, like your, your accent gets you so much farther in life, man. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, I was just, uh, you know, to, to the South African brothers, uh, they just won the Rugby World oh, Cup. Man. So, yeah. um, he must be over the moon. He's <laughs> one of my other like really good friends is uh, is is from England. So like it's I got both ends <laughs> of the spectrum like just pushing and pulling. It's pretty funny. So uh, awesome. yeah, man, he's he's super excited. So let's you know again, three or four years have gone by. Uh, you had, you had done a, a couple of re- smaller real estate deals, I think, when we first had you on the show, and you were I I can't recall again. I, I just it's been a number of years. Um, you you had a lot of uh, big projects in the works. Um, you've executed on a number of those projects to date. And so maybe you talk about the transition that you made from, you know, when that big turning point was from when you're just going from the smaller projects, smaller multifamily deals and did your first larger syndication, larger meeting, a hundred plus doors. Yep. So I think probably three or four years ago, I would have just been uh, maybe co GPing with my, with my mentor at the time, probably closing on, um, a, a larger deal, maybe for my first one, uh, as a co GP and, and for anyone out there who doesn't understand what that is, I, I sort of to, in order to scale my business or, you know, to get out of my, uh, my own way, essentially I had to surround myself with other people who, who, who had done, you know, large multifamily because my credibility three, four, five years ago when I first moved to the United States or first got started investing in the United States wasn't that great. And so I had to go out and ride the coattails of other people. And probably when I was on the first on your show, I think I maybe done one or two with my mentor, used his credibility, leveraged into deals, became a co-GP. And then pretty shortly after that, probably being on your show, I went out and branched out on my own, uh, being the lead syndicator, uh, raising money for my own deals. And, and, and in that time, in the last three or four years, I've closed on about 1700 units uh, with my business partner and I at Wildhorn Capital and and really but that 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 transition was from you know buying my first triplex in upstate New York with my own money to doing your first deal with a um, with a mentor to then transitioning to doing your own deals by yourself there is the the the, the the common thread is that you have to have a mentor because credibility is key. You have to go out and, um, and, and you know, establish that credibility and not everyone is born with credibility, right? No one is just born with 10 years worth of credibility in real estate investing. So it's about the team in which you set up around yourself to, to start and, and learn. And that team today looks di- a lot different from what it was three, four, five years ago when I first started. Um, but it all obviously it morphs into different things and you bring people on your team that can help you get to that next level and having, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if you're the average of the five people you surround yourself with, you're obviously going to be be elevate yourself uh, in terms of, you know, punching above your weight and, 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 and shooting for the stars. And that's essentially what I did back when I first was on the show, I probably was, you know, with a mentor trying to elevate my game be surrounded by people who are doing in the business, learn the business to then go off and do my, create my own business and my own success uh, by learning from others. And and that's really probably where I was. No, no, I think that that's an incredibly valid point. I think we talk about a lot here on the show, just, you know, don't reinvent the wheel, find someone else that's been there. They've, they've done that. They're doing it today. Exactly. What it is you want to do? And right. You say right on their coattails. I mean, whatever, however you want to define that, find a way to bring value to them in their business and, and get alongside them. You'll see right. the inner workings of their business and basically model exactly what it is they're doing. I mean, exactly. that is the fast, fast path to success in any business, you know, whether it's real right. estate or, or any other type of business. So I love to talk about the team, you know, like this is, this is not a solo man's sport, right? <laughs> I mean, it's not Reed Goosen's one man band and, uh, and we're out here, you know, you know, acquiring 400 unit apartment complexes. I mean, you know, I, I'm guessing that's possible. However, yep. uh, this is mostly a team sport. And I know that you've got a, some of a team behind you. I know you've got, there's one other principal in your company. Maybe there's more, but I believe there's one other principal. Mm-hmm. And then it's probably not just the two of you either. There's other folks involved that have really helped you to go from zero to the 1700 plus units that you control today. So maybe speak a little bit to that team yep. and you know, what the roles and responsibilities are of each one of the team members. Yeah. So, you know, for everyone, obviously most people listening to this show understand the value, you know, what syndication is. So, you know, I always look, talk about the plane analogy where you, you know, hiring a jumbo jet as, as Reed Goosen's to get from New York to LA would cost me a lot of money. But if I split it with, 
two, 300 passengers uh, and I have some passengers sitting in first class, which would probably be my GP and, and, and you know, the, the captain and co-pilot, which would be myself and my, my, my partner. Um, uh, you know, the, the, let's talk about the people in first class who, who are the, the co-GPs or the team, so to speak. And when you're pulling together large deals, it, you're, you're correct. You can't do it all in yourself. Like, you know, the fact that you're not, you don't have a net worth of, of X amount of money. You might need to bring someone in into that first class seat um, in order they can enjoy the ride. They have part of the GP. Um, they're bringing some value to the table in terms of maybe uh, a net worth, or, you know, balance, bank balance. Um, and back, you know, three, four years ago, we, uh, that, that, that first class section looked a lot larger than what it is today. And that's because my personal net worth has grown and my ability to raise capital has, has expanded similar with my, my business partner. So over time, that, that first class uh, section of the plane slowly gets smaller and smaller where you probably trim it down to being maybe three to five people at max you know, a, a U-Butte team where you can go off and close on $40, $50 million deals. Um, but but the, the, the team members in that, that first class are going to be people who can help you close on the debt. So maybe someone with a bank balance. Uh, you might need someone who, who, who's maybe found the deal. Um, you, you might need someone who can underwrite the deal or, you know, just understand the numbers behind it. You, you might need some people to help you raise capital or, you know, share in some of the responsibilities well, I've already just mentioned. Um, so, so bank balance, underwriting, finding the deals, equity, um, loan guarantors, they're sort of the sort of hats that need to be worn in order to get a deal closed. In terms of what happens once the deal is closed, you then have asset management and who can, who can take care of that? And, and you know, myself, I, I probably wear all five of those hats or a portion of all those hats, uh, but so does probably three or four other people in my first class team. Um, so, but over time to what I just said before is that that team will, will obviously dwindle and be refined and you'll, you'll understand who is the most valuable in your team. Um, mm-hmm. But the real turning point for me was uh, when I found, uh, you know, doing it as a co-GP with, with my mentor back in the day. And then when I tried to branch out on my own, it was like I was underwriting deals and I was trying to find investors and I was trying to get build bro- credibility with brokers from LA, even though I was living in LA and I was looking at deals in Texas. And, and I'd set up some of my systems in terms of my underwriting. I had hired some part-time underwriters to, to underwrite deals for me. But really what I was missing was that co uh, that not co-GP, but that actual business partner to take on um, something, you know, a skill set that I didn't have. And the skill set was... I needed someone boots on the ground, right? I, I, I was an Australian who every time I opened his mouth, you know, who the hell's this Aussie guy calling from LA trying to bid on these deals in Texas, right? So I needed <laughs> someone with that credibility. And early in the day when I was trying to branch out and, you know, buy my first call at 50, 60 unit deal, I remember getting into best and final. So my underwriting was clearly good. You know, I, I was comfortable with that. I was comfortable with the market. But I was missing out on these deals by thirty, forty thousand dollars because I didn't have that direct line to the broker who knew me, right? And I needed that, that broker credibility. So thus spawned a relationship with Wildhorn Capital. Uh, my, co-part, my, my, my partner, uh, Andrew Campbell, he's from Texas. He lives in Austin. Uh, and he also had a, a complementary skill set that I, that I didn't have, which was boots on the ground. And, and I had a complementary skill set that he didn't have. And so it was sort of really a, a harmonious um, partnership that came together um, because to understand when you go out and create your own business and like yourself, Kevin, I know you've got some, some other partners within mm-hmm. Sunrise Capital, you need to be complementary skill sets because you can't wear all the hats. And, and if you think, you know, listening to this podcast, you know, I'm going to go out and close my first 100 unit deal by yourself, like good on you if you can, but it takes a lot of different buckets to fill and those buckets maybe need different people uh, assigned to different people for their responsibility and they can then take care of that thing, which might be finding the deal or underwriting the deal or asset management, whatever it might be, just pick your lane and, and, and stick to it. And that's what you're good at. And, and, and find partners who can fill those other buckets if you don't have the skill set in order to fill those buckets. So yeah. really the, the turning point was, you know, understanding the business with, through, the, through the mentor, you know, co-GPing on a few things, you know, raising capital, doing underwriting, uh, all that sort of stuff, asset management. But then when you go out and create and be the sort of captain and co-pilot of that jumbo jet, you need to understand, well, who's, the, who, who's on, the, on the bench to, to, to fill all those buckets and I can go to and say, hey, I need some help with the bank balance or I need some help with asset management or I need some help finding deals, whatever it might be you can then quickly fill those buckets um, and those seats uh, in order to get a deal closed. Mm-hmm. Because the biggest thing you don't want to do is go and offer a deal and then be, not be able to close it because you haven't got your, your team or your bench lined up ready to come and execute. So, so yeah. Yeah, you make a, a ton of ton of incredibly valid points there. You know, I think one of the big ones being just really being able to do a self-assessment 
um, wherever you're at in your business, if you're just getting started, if you've already got some experience, whatever, like we've all got strengths, we've all got weaknesses and actually be being self-conscious of, of what those weaknesses are. And then knowing that there's some, there's surely someone else out there that can do it much better than you. That, that can actually, that is their strength. That's where they shine, right? And, and, and finding that individual that is, uh, you know, got a direct alignment with, with your core philosophy, your business philosophy, your outlook on life, your, your long-term goals, has the same interest you do as far as investing in real estate. It sounds like you found that in your partner. I've got that, that type of partner myself, right? We are, we are very similar in many ways, but very different in others. And those, other, those differences are where, his strengths basically fill the voids where I have major weaknesses and, uh, and it's complimentary. It allows us, it allow, has allowed us to grow a lot faster than what we would have if we were just, again, the one man band trying to do it ourselves. And you know, if, if your ultimate goal is to buy, you gave the reference point of like, you know, buying that, you know, hundred, hundred unit apartment complex, uh, you know, you really need a team. However, I guess if, if you're, long-term goal is just to buy one complex. You've got mm -hmm. the money to do it yourself and you're okay with having a 60 hour a week job and you want to wear all the hats. You could probably take that down, but however, you're not going to have time for anything else. And so right. I think that's really where the, you know, the barrier comes in. Like if your goal is to actually build a sustainable company on multiple assets, you need a team to do it. Otherwise, you're going to be so focused on that one building, you'll be running around like a chick with your head cut off. You're not going to have any extra time to do anything else. And you're, you're probably going to end up hating everything about real estate investing and everything about multifamily, whatever type of asset it is, you're going to hate it and probably, you know, burn yourself out and, and end up selling that thing because uh, you think it was the wrong investment. However, really it was just the wrong strategy that you took right. upon uh, acquiring right. that investment. So right. no, you, you, make, you make so many good points there. And I think as, as my portfolio has grown, you know, something like property management, for example, is, is a, is, is, is a, you know, we still hire that out to a third party vendor. We haven't mm -hmm. taken that in house, even at 1700 units. And we're going to look to double the portfolio. Um, and, and that's something that, you know, I don't know if I ever will want to take in house because it is something that I don't want to have to deal with on the day to day. And it's, you know, if you can afford to pay for it, then let them mm -hmm. deal with it, you know, and they can go off and, um, and, and manage the asset. I will say, however, you make money when you buy, you lose it through bad property management. So, um, you know, with, with, in, in terms of being the asset manager, which is what my role is within the company, you know, overseeing to make sure the day to day is in the operations and, and the construction is all going smoothly. You need to have a team and team members on board that within the, even though they might be third party that are aligned with your interests and know what they're doing in order to move that, that needle from point A to point B. Otherwise, as you said, you might get burnt out and you might think, oh, this was just a crappy you know, investment, but maybe it was just the, the wrong strategy or the wrong team member in place. And, and we've, we've had experiences over the last three or four years where bad property management, bad onsite property management has caused issues and we had to fire them and all that sort of stuff. So like, you know, there are the roles and uh, trials and tribulations that you go through when you grow any business and, and, and multifamily is no different. And, and one of those specific seats in first class mm -hmm is, uh, you know, you talk about first class all the time, is the property management role and who, who, who's going to fill that? And, and are they the right team member to move the business forward? Because I know a lot of people probably focus on, well, how am I going to get this closed? That's one step. Now the, the, the actual business creation is through creating value once you post close. So the, the, the primary seat in that position is the property manager. So how do you go and make sure you've got the right person in place in order to be successful? So let's, yeah, let's talk about that. that. That's an important one. I don't want to skip over the property management side of things. You brought up some, some, some interesting uh, points there. And one of the one, big ones being that you have had some challenges uh, at some point in time or another to where you've actually had to transition from one management company to the other. Mm -hmm. uh, would you mind elaborating a little bit on yeah. what challenges were because at the it, it's this is not a set and forget it business i mean the no, asset management role it's critical and you know the thing that i've always struggled with and we're in a different business i mean we're in a unfortunately we're in a business where uh, there really aren't that many uh, third-party management companies. Uh, there are a few. We've had some bad experiences with a couple of them uh, and, and ultimately have had to bring it all and we've had to build it in-house. So we have an entirely separate company that is a property management company. It's not the fun part of the business by any means. No. Uh, and so if we had the, the luxury of outsourcing it to a competent uh, outfit, then we ultimately would. However, we do not. And so I'd love to hear from your perspective, again, different, different industry, different space, um, you know, some of the challenges that you faced and then how you identify them, identify those challenges, how you address them, and then what it looked like moving on to another company. Yeah. So the first thing I'll say is that you made a very good point. Um, 
real estate investing in general, multifamily, mobile home park, commercial real estate investing in general is not passive. As the business owner, you will, my role, I don't just sit on the beach and do nothing. I, I have got 60 hour weeks just, and I don't even deal with the property manager. I'm looking for new deals and I'm understanding how mm-hmm. to, to keep, you know, hold, hold my property management feet to the fire to make sure that they do their job that they're supposed to be doing. Um, so, so, so if you go, you know, for those listening out there thinking, I'm just going to be passive and set and forget it. It's not a set and forget business. No business is that you, you know, that it's worth creating. Um, and you need to keep your role as the owner is to keep an eye on how operations and the day-to-day operations are going. So, uh, to specifically to your point of um, you know this, some of the trials and tribulations we've gone through, uh, we experienced when we were growing. Um, you know, I always use this analogy of um, uh, a Toyota or a BMW. You know, do you pay for a Toyota that gets you from point A to point B, or do you pay for a, a BMW that you know might pay a little bit more, but you know, might have seat warmers and all that sort of stuff? And you've got to really understand where you're going with your property management business, and they might offer you the bells and whistles. Um, and that's good. But you also got to make sure that they're actually performing. And so uh, when we first started, we got a property management, which was the, the Toyota of, you know, we'd call it a 1980s Toyota. They were, they were, they were competent enough, um, but we were growing so quickly that we quickly became their largest client and they just didn't have the back end systems, those seat warmers and all that sort of stuff um, in order to uh, accommodate our growth. Um, secondly, we were also seeing that their hiring decisions were on the, on the specific property level uh, side of the business was not the probably best, um, the best, you know, calls. And, and that's sort of, it's not necessarily all their fault. It was more to do with the way the market is right now, attracting, you know, people into your business. You know, you're paying them 40, 50, $60,000 a year to, to manage 20, $30 million assets. You know, they're not necessarily always thinking like an owner would think. And so you're trying to instill that in the actual, in, in the regional manager and the regional manager needs to instill that in the, into the, the onsite team and that onsite team takes ownership of the deal. That's been my, probably the biggest learning curve for me is like, how do you make a person who is only earning 50, 55, $60,000 a year think like an owner? And it's very, that, that is a challenge. And that is what we found with the first property manager. We had to shift to a set to, to the BMW with the seat warmers and you know, the tinted windows and all that sort of stuff because we needed that more of a uh, business culture uh, to, to, for people to buy into the system, to buy into the processes in order to make our deal successful. And so that's very important when you are looking and interviewing property managers You've got to look at the business culture of it. How do people like working for this for this property management team? Property management in general is a very cyclical, um, not well, not necessarily cyclical business, but they have a lot of turnover because mm-hmm. because of the barriers to you know, of what people are being paid. You know, you're not you're not everyone's getting paid six figures. You know, they're they you know on-site managers and you know lead maintenance are only maybe getting paid twenty twenty one dollars an hour. So they will quit <laughs> over two dollars difference an hour in pay. And so how do you keep them there as an owner because it's not just the pay that speaks volumes, it's maybe the culture that you want mm-hmm. to deal with in the community and in within your portfolio. So it's really, I've noticed as an owner, it's very important to have, you know, um, a culture within a business and not just my business, but also within the property management business in order to retain quality folk. And we've had to, we've had to weed out a few bad apples, it, it, not, not necessarily just in the, in the, the, the property management company, but the individual on-site team members that you've got to weed out to make sure they're all rowing in the same direction and not, you know, causing issues and, and, and being yeah. overwhelmed and all that sort of stuff. So yeah, we, we're definitely in the last three to five years have, have, have learned that and, and, you know, not every, and, and the other thing I'll say is that property management, no one ever loves their property manager, right? You know, you always want it to be done better. Um, and, and really as a business owner, it's just, you know, probably like yourself, you probably grappled with uh, the, the, do I really want to bring this in house? Because it's a lot more work for you to go out and build this team of property management yeah. than to sort of hand it off to someone and sort of not at arm's length, but sort of be, oversee the regional manager who oversees the day to day. So it's, it's a, I've definitely grappled with it. You know, had, I, I know that probably as I start to double the portfolio, I may have to bring that in house and, and that's the sort of engineer brain in me wanting to control everything. But I also need to understand how I go off and do that and, and do it successfully. And we've, you know, my business partner, and I had definitely spoken about, I think the best cleanest way would be to go and acquire an existing property management company and not yes. really come in and, and, and ruffle the feathers, just sort of, mm-hmm. you know, where the CEOs, where, where the backers, but you keep doing your thing. We love your culture. 
you know, we just want to help you grow and we're sort of, you know, keep the same team in place. That would probably be my ideal. The second one would be back a, find a regional manager who's really entrepreneurial and, and a gun and say, hey, you go build this, you go build the system, <laughs> we will yeah. back you. So it, there's a, a lot, said a lot there, but that is, that is sort of where I'm at right now with my business and how it's going to move forward. Okay. The, the different struggles we've had over the years. So yeah, yeah, no, fantastic. So just just get some clarity here. Um, going from that Toyota to that BMW, you know, the analogy that you use there, moving property management companies, was it just merely a difference of price? Like the actual, you know, what what they charged you for their services, one was more expensive than the other. Is that? Yeah, so, so the, the what's called a burden um, uh, is is the percentage that they will take um, mm-hmm. to pay, you know, incentives to have their back end systems all well. You know, I think the average burden we were seeing was like twenty eight to thirty percent, um, and they were at like thirty four percent or thirty five percent. So they were a little bit more on the expensive side. That's why I use the, but yet they're paying their property managers the same value as what they're paying the original company was paying. So what, what does that burden buy me, right? And, and that burden buy, buy me better systems, better mm-hmm. oversight, better mentorship within the company so people can be successful and grow into their, into their roles. That's what I'm paying for and that's what I expect and that's what, what I need to hold the regional and the business development managers at those companies to their feet to the fire to say, hey, I'm, I'm paying you this BMW level service. You better be getting your systems in place in order to make sure my team, my, the onsite team is the most successful. You know, so yeah. <laughs> yeah. What and what does the dynamic of that uh, of that relationship look like between the you know the onsite folks, your team at Wildhorn Capital and the property management company? You, I mean, you yep. don't have a direct involvement with the onsite folks. You're basically working through the property management company yep. uh, to get to the onsite folks. Correct. So we, we we started with just going to the regional, um, and as we've grown we really wanted to instill ownership from the individual property managers. So it's gone from weekly calls with just the regional manager, giving us a high level to, you know, coming to now having all the on the, the, the lead managers from the onsite, from each te- from each site on the phone, giving us a 15 minute update every week. We can then ask questions directly to them about specific, you know, occupancy or issues or, you know, any concessions or any, you know, any, any day to day stuff we can more drill down with the, with the one-on-one and that, that, that we found um, that that builds, you know, confidence and, and, and we instill confidence in them that we trust what mm-hmm. they're, they're doing and they've got to, and they've got to take some ownership and say, Hey, the owners are on the phone. Um, they've got questions to ask. You've got to step up to the plate and you know be confident yeah. in, in what you're doing. So there, there's a little bit of that dynamic going on by 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 drilling down and being a direct line to contact. We've always been those owners that we are a small company. Um, if you pick up the phone, if you have any issues, pick up the phone, email us. You know, we're not we're we're, we're not this sort of big board of directors and blah blah blah. And there's layers of corporation. We're none of that. It's just two of us. If you've got an issue, call us up. We'll get it fixed. We'll get it handled really really quickly. So that's fantastic. It also allows you to actually instill your your culture. You know, the company culture exactly. that you guys want to pass on. Right. That's really where the question derived from is how do you instill this company culture into these you know this on site staff when ultimately they're taking direction from the property management company, which right. probably doesn't have the exact alignment of company culture that you guys might, right? And so, yeah, no, that, um, and that's correct. And so, you know, how to build leadership, that's not my role. That's not my, what yeah. I do, but how to build support and how to build uh, gratitude is, you know, hey guys, you know, we, we really thank you, you know, for all you're doing. But on the other hand, if, you know, if they've made a mistake and we're like, I'm calling it out, like, why'd you rent that unit? For only fifty bucks more a week, oh, that was because you know LRO or the self software system told me to. I was like, well, hang on. If you know that we've already spent X amount of dollars, like think for yourself a little bit here. You can override that, and so just questioning, not questioning their decisions, but question, encouraging them to think bigger and think outside the box. And you know, one thing we've grappled with a little bit is you know pushing that GPR, which is great, but then the expenses, you know. Uh, go to go to a whack, or they look they control expense and they can't do the GPR. Like it's sort of it's trying to balance that. You got to have your eyes on both GPR and expenses to to move this NOI forward, and and not one or the other. You know can't you know you, you just trying to make them think like like we would think is 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 challenging, and yet not always my responsibility. But I try every now and then to instill confidence in the team and that they're doing the great job. And 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 you know over time we will have a really great team, and I know we're building towards um, something that it's you know it's going to 
it, it doesn't happen overnight, but it will happen. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, fantastic. So I, I'm gonna. I love to switch gears if we could. Sure. Uh, read a couple of the topics I want to cover here before we wrap it up for the day. Um, you know, one of the big questions I get quite often from from new folks that are looking to get into, you know, I say commercial real estate investing. You know, larger assets that could mean multifamily, self storage, mobile home parks. You know, and all the above is the debt side of things. You know, I, I think that is a uh, that that is an area where a lot of people lack experience of actually choosing the right debt vehicle for that particular investment, but not just the particular investment for the actual strategy that you're going to instill into that investment. Right. Meaning like, you know, length of hold time. Uh, is it a value add play where you look to do a cash out refinance, maybe look to exit out of it in three to five years, what have you. And so I'd love to get from your perspective of exactly how you guys go about choosing the right type of debt to put onto that property. And ultimately, what does that look like? What does your, your strategy look like? Are you guys 10 year holds? Are you three to five year exits? Um, generally speaking, I know that every deal is a little yep. different, but just I'd love to get your perspective on those two things. Yeah. So in general, we do go for the Freddie and Fanny product. Um, in the beginning, we have chosen some deals. We've done bridge product and we've also done agency. Uh, but in looking back on maybe the first two deals, we got we locked in some five-year term stuff or seven-year term stuff where we probably, looking back on it, we wish we could get out of it sooner um, just because we've credited all that value and we want to be at like the exit, the, the, the prepayment penalty was just is, is, is too high right now. Um, it, but yet the market has compressed in cap rates even more. And so it's just like, great, let's let's sell um, to get a run on the board. So looking back, um, yeah, we I think the big thing for me, like what what is the risk that we look at right now is interest rates. So, mm -hmm. you know, one thing that's a great product is the Freddie and Fanny floating debt, um, right? You can buy a cap on it. Mm -hmm. um, but the floating rate allows you to get out whenever you want. I think it's a pre, pre lockout of 12 months. Um, but then after that, you can get out whenever the hell you want. And so you don't have to wait for that five or, or seven year defeasance uh, to, 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 to burn off. Um, and, and, you know, the, the part of the way we were thinking back in the day is that, okay, if we lock in this low rate fixed rate interest rate for you know, five years interest only on a 10 year term, you know, it's really reducing risk for investors because we have this long term horizon. It's five years interest only. Um, but, you know, we might have locked it in. I know we got one deal at like 4.6%. And that was like two and a half years ago. Uh, and look at interest rates now, they're 4.1. So no one's going to come along and assume that loan because we never thought that the loan interest rates were going lower. You know, they, we, <laughs> we thought they were going to go higher. So, you know, we, we locked into something that is, you know, now we're like, oh, we've, got to, we've got to live with it. So we've got to look, look at like, you know, supplemental loans and all that sort of stuff with Freddie and Fannie. But I think for us, um, I do like some of the bridge products that are out there, particularly if it's on a heavy value add to, to go and get the, the loan to cost uh, and get some of the capital expenditure covered by the loan. It can really be work wonders because you mean you don't have to raise as much equity um, mm -hmm. but it really depends on the deal in which and you're back to your, your strategy of when you want to exit so you really got to look at okay what's your strategy here um, allowing the most flexibility uh, we just closed on a 350 unit deal where it is a 10-year uh, term five years interest only but we bought down the defeasance to I think I think six years so we could ultimately exit as early as year five um, mm -hmm. because we wanted that flexibility and, and we paid a little bit more in interest rates for it but it, that flexibility on the exits. We could get that five-year IO, but we want to be able to get out of it at the five-year term, not have to hold it for 10, but we want it, you know, to get a, to get five years IO, you might have to go for the 10-year term. Um, but but now looking back, you know, I definitely think that the floating rate is, uh, is very attractive um, in terms mm -hmm. of being able to, the flexibility to have the IO, have the gold standard of, of debt, um, but then be able to exit whenever the hell you want. So, um, so yeah. Yeah. No, and, and the thing is like sometimes, I mean, going into it, you might have your strategy set, like, I mean, which you probably did a couple of years ago, the couple of years you just mentioned, right? I mean, you kind of had the strategy set as like, there's no way we, we're going we're gonna to exit out of this thing in, in, right. in you know, less than 10 years. However, times change, right? And so you always got to kind of think through, Not you're not always going to know what all the exit exits might look like or how times are going to change, how the future is going to change. However, I think you do want to kind of walk into you know, into deals with, two potential scenarios, like, a, you know, an A scenario, B scenario, and ultimately, you know, what's it going to look like um, if the B scenario plays out with the type of debt you're putting in place? There's no, per a lot of times there's not, there's not like a perfect solution to match both A and B scenarios. However, you just want to be aware of it and be conscious of it just so that you can plan accordingly. And one thing I'll add to that is the reason 
we're not second guessing ourselves, looking back and thinking, gosh, I wish I got a floater on that is because as we grow our portfolio, investors are starting to come to us and say, well, where's your first exit? You know, we, and we're trying to say, well, we've still got the ones from three or four years ago. We're trying to get to an exit. Yeah. Uh, and the, but the, but the debt is enabling, uh, disabling us from, from exiting sooner rather than later. And, and for us as, as wild on, we want to show a run on the board and say, Hey, this is a deal we've come full cycle. So understanding as you, not necessarily just from the individual deal point of view, but when you go and grow a business in multifamily or any commercial real estate, having runs on the board are really important. And investors mm-hmm. want to start seeing that, particularly when you've been raising capital for three, four, five years. Um, so it's just the the, 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 hey, look at that deal we just we just closed on, um, or we just we just sold, and we got a you know double you know double our investors' money, or whatever it might be. That is a great marketing tool to go out and continue to double our portfolio because we have things to show our runs on the board and, and, and successes that we can we can point to, and that's really important as you go to try and scale a business. Absolutely, so that's that's another exit strategy that you have to think about which you might not necessarily think about is the best for that individual deal, but it's the best for the business as a whole to go out and yes. buy another thousand units. Yes, so. absolutely. No, no, great points there. I'd love to get your perspective on a, on, you know, a SWOT analysis. For those folks that don't know what a SWOT analysis is, you know, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats, and how that pertains to not just multifamily in general, but you know, to the markets that you're in. I know that you're in Texas, and I believe that you, you've got Austin. Are you in anywhere else other Austin, than Austin? San, San Antonio, okay, and Austin. So, yeah, look, in terms of where we are in the market cycle right now, we are definitely doubling down on markets where you have high barriers to entry and the mm-hmm. demand is extremely high. So we are definitely coming into, and Austin has just been such a unique example of a uh, of a market that uh, in the last 20 years has transitioned from what I would call a tier two market really into a tier one market. It's, it's, it's the, the Brooklyn with cowboy boots. You know, it's, it's direct flights to <laughs> London and Europe every single week. There's a lot of tech going on there. There's a lot of growth, yet Dirt is trading for, you know, new ground up construction dirt is trading in downtown Austin is trading for just as much as dirt in downtown Los Angeles, like Mm -hmm. two, three hundred bucks a square foot. You know, uh, approvals to get things approved by the city is taking 12 to 24 months. So that barrier to get new product in the ground is very high. Uh, So when you have that high barrier to entry, uh, you're obviously going to have lower cap rates. Now, lower cap rates is obviously an effect on, on cash flow, but look at San Francisco, look at New York, look at Australia, look at Singapore, look at Hong Kong, look at London. They all have had historically low cap rates because the demand is so high, yet the supply is low in those cities. Mm -hmm. And over the long term, and I'm talking 20, 30 years, your growth is going to outstrip a secondary market where it's got a slow and steady wins the race. Well, you might have more cash flow, but the appreciation is not there in the long term. So we are really looking at, uh, from an insulation point of view, when a market does correct, um, that you're in a market where you, you, you have that, that X factor that, that other markets may not have and they may, get, they may get caught up a little bit. And you, you will pay more to get into those markets, don't get me wrong. Mm-hmm. But on a long-term horizon um, where, in my viewpoint, being Australian, being a foreigner, is that the last, since the recession, multifamily in particular, commercial real estate as well in, as a whole, has experienced a real huge boom and people have doubled, tripled their money in three to five years. We are not in that market anymore. Uh, we are in a market, and I come from a market where if you double your money in 10 years, that's a really good return. Mm-hmm. Um, and we're now starting to see those, you know, and that's why our, our investment horizons have changed from five years to six, seven, eight years, even 10 year holds, because the cash flow might not be great on the front end, but over the long term, you still make a really good ROI. So readjusting investors' expectations um, mm-hmm. and, and putting in, you know, going into markets where the investment on the front end. The cash flow might, might not be there straight away, but after two or three years, it will start to get there. But over a 10-year hold, you're, you're doubling or tripling your money and, and you have the, the, the protection of the market because this, the demand is so high for people living there. So really, from our point of view, it is trying to find those, um, those markets where, that is, where we're positioning ourselves to have a long-term hold but also re- readjusting investors' expectations to say, hey, we're going into markets where the returns are lower because the risk is lower and thus you have to be okay with those returns. Yeah. If you want to go out and get you know, 18 19% IRRs, go nuts. But in, in a, if you're going to hold that for a long period of time, how's that going to be affected in a downturn? And so you've got to really got to think about that sort of stuff as an investor, as a market you know, 
strategist because that's what you are as an, as an investor and, a, and an operator uh, and how you're going to in, insulate yourself from a potential mm-hmm. downturn. Mm-hmm. No, great points, great points. Appreciate you giving us some feedback there. So, Reed, I'd love to enter into what we call the lightning round. This is something new that we start on the show. And this is where I'd, I'd like to ask you six very short, concise questions looking for sure. six very short, concise answers. So, first one, biggest fear, what is it? My biggest fear is uh, regret. Um, waking up one day that I will have regretted something, that I didn't take action on something and I'll ultimately regret it. So, regret. Yeah. Good deal. How about one biggest Let's see. No, that's actually, actually the next one, the biggest regret, which is probably very similar. Oh, no, actually, no, I'm, I'm going to cut this part out. Um, that just caught me off guard. So how about your one biggest regret? My one biggest regret? Um, I don't have any yet. <laughs> I, think people, I, I think people who say, would you change anything in your past? My answer to them is no, because my past has shaped me who, who I am today. Yeah. So there's no regrets, touch wood. Um, so keep living <laughs> the way I'm doing. So yeah, I'm sure there will be, but I'm not, 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 not yet. Got it, got it. How about most influential business book? Uh, obviously, Rich Dad, Poor Dad would be um, f- from the beginning. But for those people who are more established and looking to create credibility you know, with their business, another one is Key Person of Influence uh, by Dan Priestley. Mm. So uh, Rich Dad, Poor Dad is one. KPI is another. It doesn't have anything to do with real estate. It's just more to... How do you position yourself as a key person of influence in your industry, in your sphere? And I think it's very important for people as they grow businesses to understand that in this world of new technology. So, yeah. Guys, and I'll make sure I put that in the show notes for you as well. And then uh, outside the daily work, Ryan, what do you do to decompress, man? Decompress. I love surfing. That's it. I'm a huge, okay. I love, I'm a big surfer and I, I, I'm, I love to be active. If I don't, if I miss two days of whether going for a run or going to the gym, I start getting a little stir crazy. So my decompression is, is being, is being fit. And then I've just started, you know, last probably year, year and a half is meditation is really important to me and, and mm-hmm. be able to, to catch myself in the day and take three deep, breath, deep breaths before I'm getting on a call or before I'm doing something just to recenter myself. And it's really important to keep that clarity of mind with so much stuff going on. So, so working out, surfing and, and a bit of meditation. Good deal. Good deal. How about the one thing that you can't live without? Oh, the one thing I can't live without. That's a very, um, one thing I can't live without. Um, uh, that's a good question. If your wife's listening to this call, you better say, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, the one thing I can't live advice without, from one married guy to the other. No, from, from uh, <laughs> you know, it obviously is, is fair, you know, I, I would say I wouldn't be where I am today without the support of not only just my wife, but also my family, my upbringing. Yeah. Very, yeah. very, very uh, blessed that, that I've been able to have that upbringing. So, so yeah. Okay. Good deal. How about the backup plan? If one day you woke up and just said, you know what, man, I'm kind of burnt out for this real estate thing, but you had all the money in the world, didn't really need to do it anymore just for the money. You know, what would you do with your free time? So some people don't know this about me. I was a competitive show jumping horse rider back in the day. My parents had a small farm. We didn't have any here. We didn't have anything crazy in terms of, you know, expensive horses. We just had nags from the, from the, from the racetrack, but I would, I would get back into show jumping. I think it was, it's a really awesome sport. Uh, it's a, I love horses and, 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 you know, whether it's competitive or, or something like that, but if I had, if money wasn't an object, it would definitely be, uh, Maybe represent Australia at the Olympics one day. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, no, jumping. that's awesome. So, that's, yeah. Show jumping horses and surfer. Like I love to see those like two posters on the wall, like blown up with a Reed's face on it, right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> two, exactly. two very different sports. Different very different sports. sports. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, good deal. Well, Reed, you've shared a lot of great information here today. It's been a lot of fun having you back on the show. And um, like we do in, in each and every show, I like to round it out with what I call the golden nugget segment. And this is where I like, like if you if you could have one last final golden nugget with advice or wisdom that you can leave with our listeners today that may motivate and inspire them as they progress in their real estate investing career. What would that one last golden nugget be, man? Yeah, the, the, I think the one last golden nugget would be that um, a fool and their money are easily parted. And that's an old saying my dad uh, told me back in the day. And really, it means that don't be a fool with your money. Don't be ignorant. You know, Go out and be educated. And, and education doesn't stop when you leave university or leave high school. Like If you stop learning you stop growing and so Mm -hmm. that don't be that fool keep learning keep keep absorbing um knowledge because that's going to help you you progress along the track towards whatever success looks like in your life 
So yeah, yeah. no, that, that's wonderful. And I want to make sure that we don't miss out on this point. This kind of ties right into that. You know, to, you know, continually be on that that path to education. And uh, I know that you um, are not just a one time author, but a two time author. So again, you somehow you you fit more than twenty four hours in any given day. Um, you've written two books over the last couple of years. So if if you don't mind, I'd love for you to share a little yeah. bit of feedback on each one of those and uh, let our folks know where they can go grab a copy. Yeah. So the first one I launched last year, which is investing in the US, the ultimate guide to US real estate. And this is just all the best episodes and best bits from my podcast, uh, jam packed into a book. And it's just sort of a step-by-step guide of really how I had to learn the systems, investing lingo here, how to get set up, how to, what is syndication? What's 1031? Really just a overall, how to build a team, how to find a market to invest in. This is, that's this book. It's sort of very short, concise, but everything I needed to learn to get involved in the US market. And then this is not just for international investors. This is for everyone involved. That's the first one that can be, you can find that on, on Amazon. The second one is a cool one. I just launched uh, July 4th with uh, seven other Aussies and it's called 10,000 miles to the American dream. Uh, our story of financial freedom. So about two or three years ago, uh, longer than actually four years ago, uh, I started a mastermind group with uh, seven other Aussies because I'd, I'd just been introduced to them all in the real estate field. Uh, we, be, we created, we became good mates out of it. Uh, we thought, hey, we've all got a story. We're, let's, let's all go write a chapter. And we created this book. And so everyone's got a chapter in this book. It, it's, we all have successful real estate businesses mm-hmm. in different real estate areas. One guy's in real estate technology. I'm obviously in um, multifamily, but I talk a little bit about branding and I, I use a thing called the 6P formula and how you brand yourself correctly and go raise more money. Someone talks about hotel investing. We've got other guys in the, in the fix and flip business. Um, so we talk a lot of different things, different stories in this book. Uh, and it's really to do with, you know, um, the, the power of bringing uh, like-minded people together. And then this is just, uh, you know, the formation of three or four years of, of mates coming and writing a book together. So the, so the two books, Investing in the US and 10,000 Miles to the American Dream. And both of those can be found on, uh, on my website at readgoosens.com and, uh, or, or on Amazon. So um, please go grab Fantastic. a copy. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. That's awesome, man. That's awesome. Is there anything else of relevance that, that we might have missed out on today that you'd like to share with the listeners before we wrap it up? No, I think you know, you're know doing an awesome job, mate. And uh, you know, the one other thing, if anyone is ever in LA and they want to stop in and say good day and have a beer or have lunch, you, know, you, can, you can always hit me up at uh, just shoot me an email at info, that's I-N-F-O mm-hmm. at readgoosens.com. And I'm all, I always love catching up with people coming through LA uh, to talk shop, particularly about real estate. So yeah. Good deal. Well, awesome, Reed, man. Thanks again for coming on the show. It's been great having you back here again after so many years. We'll try to we'll try to condense that time frame next time around because I know that you're going to be making big things happen here in the next you know year or two. And so we'll be sure to have you back and get an update and uh, talk about those four thousand units that you've got under management <laughs> at that point in time. And and hopefully you haven't told me at that point that you decided to actually build your own property management company. Maybe you bought one, but hopefully it didn't go down the path of uh, no return of uh, building your own property management company. Right. I'll have to come to you for that advice, mate. Right. <laughs> yeah. Right. 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 All right. Well, Reed, thank you again, man, for coming on the show. And guys, thank you to each and every one of you for tuning into this week's show. And until we meet again next week, this is your host, Kevin Bob, wishing you huge success. Take care. Congratulations. Now you've got more of the best tricks of the trade in building massive amounts of passive income from real estate. For more amazing resources, visit realestateinvestingforcashflow.com. And we'll see you next Monday morning.